Good evening, and welcome to Kendall College. I'm excited to welcome everyone tonight, not only our panelists, but our guests. I know we have some students and faculty, as well as some members from the outside business community. Um, I'm Michelle Cousins. I'm dean of the School of Business here. And we have four schools at Kendall College. Many people I know are aware of our culinary school, because, of course, we all love the food. But we actually have three other schools in addition to culinary. We have the School of Education. School of Hospitality Management, and of course my personal favorite, the School of Business. We offer Bachelor of Arts degrees in all of those schools, and so this is a great opportunity tonight for you to see some of the things that we integrate into our courses. We make our courses very interactive, we connect with the business community as well as current issues. And for those of you who may know someone interested in going back to school or starting college, uh, we have an adult learner population. We have community college transfer students. We have students fresh out of high school. And we also have a very significant international population. So roughly 15 to 20% of Kendall students are international students. And we think that that adds a lot of value to their experience and prepares them well for the kinds of uh, work experiences that they're, that they're going to have when they leave here. Uh, our fall quarter doesn't start until, August, uh, until October 3rd. So if you do know of anybody, uh, there are brochures in the back. Uh, the business school has a Bachelor of Arts in Business, and we offer traditional weekday courses as well as fully online courses. So we have pretty much something for everyone. So tonight we are going to focus on topics uh, related to uh, legal uh, avenues for business professionals. And if you think about it, uh, our personal lives and our professional lives are more and more intertwined. And a lot of the challenges that we face, we face at home, and then that interferes with uh, a lot of our abilities in the workplace. And so we picked out some very timely subjects for tonight. And in a minute, I'll be introducing you to the people on our panel. Before we do that, I do want to mention that although this is a legal topic uh, workshop, this is not personal legal advice, and it's not personal financial advice. So uh, know that we do not accept any liability for anything we're going to be saying tonight. Um, so we have a cross-section of subjects uh, around civil unions, elder law, succession planning, uh, marital and divorce concerns. And then when you think about it as a business person, this is all something new to a lot of us or stressful for us. And so we have someone on the panel who's actually a business owner who can talk to us in terms of this is how you can manage your way through that as a business person and still live a healthy lifestyle. So hopefully you'll get a lot out of tonight's evening. We would love for you to ask questions. We want it to be very interactive. So let me go ahead and introduce our panelists. Um, and uh, as I do, I, I want to mention uh, one article from the Chicago Tribune uh, that talked about stress in the workplace. And so this will be kind of a setup for uh, the introductions I'm going to be giving on the different topics. Um, Chicago Tribune on August 26th came out reporting on an annual survey by Harris Interactive that 73% of Americans are stressed at work. I don't think any of us are surprised by that. In fact, we might be surprised that it's not higher than 73%. Um, a variety of factors contribute, but things like annoying coworkers, commuting, high workload, work-life balance, and the boss. Right? So, again, very uh, symbolic that we are balancing a lot of things as we try to live enjoyable lives and be productive at work. So, tonight, we'll have panelists talking about business implications when entering into a civil union, elder law, marriage and divorce, the financial impacts, business succession planning, and then how bad health can lead to uh, bad judgment as well as lawsuits. So, please join me. In welcoming our panel, we have first Abrar Azamuddin. He is currently an associate at the law offices of Burton A. Brown, and he's been in private practice since 2008 as a civil litigator. He has experience in representing construction firms and small firms uh, from initial contract review to the foreclosure of mechanic liens. He also has experience with property disputes in divorces and civil unions. He attended Loyola University Chicago and Marquette University Law School. 
And then second, we have Burton A. Brown, and he is the principal at his law firm, and he is a graduate of Hamlin Law School in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, for the first 10 years of his practice, he concentrated on state and federal criminal defense. His firm practices in the areas of elder law, matrimonial, commercial litigation, and business and real estate. And next to him is Barbara Riley. Barbara served as a judge in Cook County for 14 years and in the Domestic Relations Division for nine years. She has an extensive career in law. She'll share her insights tonight into protecting assets, uh, both before and during divorce proceedings, as well as the realities of asset division. And then uh, at the end of the table, last but definitely not least, is Bob DeFiglio. He's an owner of several businesses, and he's come to see in recent years an unprecedented amount of stress in business people as they struggle to survive. Uh, as they struggle to obtain new businesses and also as they uh, want to do better this year than last year. He will draw from his own experience and the shared experience of others to give essential advice on managing stress during these difficult times. And so uh, we welcome Bob as well. So as we get started this evening, we're going to ask Abrar to go ahead and kick this off. And he is going to talk about business implications when entering into a civil union. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, there it is. There. Um, you know, I could probably boil down the impact of civil union, of a civil union law on Illinois businesses in two sentences. So if you take anything away from my presentation, take this part uh, away. One, if you're an employer and you offer benefits to your employees as spouses, then you must offer those same benefits to civil union to your employees' civil union partners. The second thing is, if you're an employee and you're in a civil union, then if your employer is offering some benefits to uh, their other employees, that, or their spouses, I take that back, the spouses of their other employees, then they must offer your civil union partner those same uh, benefits as well. And that's essentially, if you simplify it down, that's essentially what the civil union law does. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be going over some of the, there are two things I'll be going over. One, the particulars of the civil union law, and uh, secondly, which uh, may not have as much uh, of a le legal implication on business owners, but uh, some recognition issues between Illinois and the federal uh, laws and Illinois and other state laws. Now, the particulars of this is that Illinois defines marriage as uh, a marriage, a relationship between a man and a woman. So what the Illinois legislature did was pass the Illinois uh, Religious Freedom Protection and Civil Union Act. Under that law, uh, I should clarify that under that law, civil unions are just not for same-sex couples. They also can apply to uh, opposite gender relationships as well. Uh, however, the civil union law was primarily directed as a vehicle to legally recognize uh, same-sex relationships. Now, there are 14 sections. I won't bore you all with the 14 sections. I mean, it's long, and uh, you know, you, uh, I don't want you all to fall asleep. Otherwise, my other panelists may get angry at me. Nonetheless, um, to form a civil union, you must be over 18. You must otherwise be permitted by law. and a civil union is performed or certified as a marriage in Illinois. So basically, anything you do to get married in Illinois applies equally to a civil union. So if you use a religious official to sign off on your marriage license, then you could do the same thing for a civil union. When you go get the marriage license from a clerk, then you, know, you can also get a civil union license as well. Essentially, the civil union law relies upon the Illinois marriage statute. And it basically says uh, whatever is good in the marriage statute and the dissolution of marriage statute is equally as good for the civil union uh, laws as well. Um, and so what does that essentially mean? You enter into a civil union and uh, all of a sudden the term, is, in the Marriage Act they use the term spouse. So if in any act in Illinois uses the term spouse, that also applies to a civil union partner. This creates certain rights for civil union partners. 
first and foremost, the right to acquire and own property jointly. Um, Judge O'Reilly, I think, will be talking a lot about the dissolution of marriage and protecting uh, property uh, or your businesses uh, in case of divorce. That also applies to civil unions. Um, Section 503 of the uh, Illinois Marital uh, Act creates a marital right in the property. So whenever you marry somebody, they'll automatically, it's, it's a little more complicated, but they'll automatically gain a share into your property. Same thing with civil unions. You enter into a civil union, it automatically creates a right into your property. Um, there's other rights that are created. The right to make decisions on behalf of your spouse or partner in medical context. Um, the right to automatic inheritance. Uh, one really important provision is the right to uh, be a parent to a child. Um, you know, in a civil union, you're automatically granted that right uh, subject to certain specific provisions, but generally speaking, you're automatically granted that right. Before, same-sex couples had to uh, use other legal methods such as adoption, but now this creates an automatic parenting right. Um, the right to spousal privileges in court, including the freedom from compelled testimony. Any lawyer will tell you that the best witness for any case is not the person themselves, but their spouse. Because what do they do? They go home and they tell their spouse. And under the legal, in the civil law, you cannot compel a wife or a husband to testify against their spouse. Uh, similarly, you can't force a civil union partner to testify against their uh, civil union partner. Um, just like it creates a right in the property, it also creates burdens of uh, spousal support, the division of estate, and contribution of fees. Now, let's say a civil union couple goes uh, and files a petition for divorce. Um, couples who obtain a civil union in Illinois can also uh, get, their, uh, get a divorce here in Illinois as well, which kind of leads me to my next topic, and it's a little complicated, so I'm going to use that board over there to explain it to you. It's the idea of recognition. We all know that not all states have the same laws when it comes to civil unions and marriages as Illinois does. That creates problems because in most other jurisdictions, if you get married in, Wa in the state of Washington, it'll be recognized in Illinois. You get married in any other of the 49 states, it'll get recognized in, Ill in Illinois and vice versa. The problem happens now is that we all know that this is a contentious issue. I'm not going to get into the particulars of why people feel what they feel. What I'm going to show you is what states do and how the laws all intersect. So if you'll indulge me for a second. This is Illinois right here, and up there is Connecticut, and that's DC. Now, the best way to explain this to you is by example. So if two, if two people, Mike and Jim, enter, uh, gain a marriage or enter into a marriage in Connecticut where a, a same-sex marriage is recognized, then in Illinois, you're not recognized here as a married couple. What you are recognized here as is a civil union. Let me write that out here. So if Jim and Mike enter into a marriage in Illinois, it's only recognized as a civil union. Now, in any other state, that's true as well. So if they recognize, a, if they recognize gay marriage in any other state, when you come to Illinois, it's only recognized as a civil union and not marriage. Now, what if you enter into a civil union in another state that doesn't recognize marriage? Well, if you come to Illinois, the rule is if it's substantially similar, then they'll recognize your uh, civil union here in Illinois. You don't have to get, enter into a civil union in, in Illinois to get protection from Illinois laws but you just have to make sure that the state that you get a civil union in is similar to Illinois. And I believe most states are 
Um, so there isn't much concern there yet. Where it gets tricky is when you deal with the federal government. About uh, in 1996, the US government passed this uh, act called the Defense of Marriage Act. And the Defense of Marriage Act has two sections. One, it doesn't recognize same-sex relationships uh, in federal law. So anytime an act has the word spouse in it, it only means between a man and a woman. Um, the other thing is that it doesn't require, uh, we're getting into a little com more complicated things than I want to, but there's this idea of full faith and credit in law. And the, it, it's a reason why a marriage in Illinois is recognized as a marriage in Connecticut. And states are supposed to honor other states' laws. And so if you're married in Illinois, you'll be recognized as a married couple in Connecticut. What the federal government did, or what Congress did to get around that, was pass the Defense of Marriage Act. And in the Defense of Marriage Act, it says that other states don't have to recognize same-sex relationships uh, that, are, that are recognized in other states. What does that mean? It means that a civil union in Illinois doesn't need to be recognized in New Mexico. Whereas a marriage in Illinois does have to be recognized in uh, New Mexico. That's what that means. In de because of the Defense of Marriage Act, you, you enter into a number of problems. And a lot of it has to do with benefits. Um, you create a certain right in uh, spousal benefits that you get in uh, Illinois for civil unions, but you don't get that in the federal government. I'll give you a quick example. When there's a divorce in Illinois, and let's say Jim and Mike get here, they recognize their Illinois as a civil union, they divorce in civil union, um, and that's granted. If Jim is only earning, if Jim stayed at home and had an income of zero, and Mike had an income of 100000 with a home, that's the assets that they enter into when they dissolve this. Now let's say, let's say, let's say a judge decides that home goes to Jim and Mike has to pay Jim $1,000 every month in alimony. Now under Illinois law, under Illinois law, that $1,000 and that home is not taxed at all. So, uh, it, Jim doesn't have to pay taxes on that $1,000 and he doesn't have to pay taxes on that home. And Mike, what he can do is claim that as a deduction. The tricky part is when you report this to the IRS. Now, nobody likes reporting anything to the IRS, but you have to. What Jim has to do is report that home as income. And what Jim also has to do is report that $1,000 as income. And what Mike has to do, Mike doesn't get that deduction for that $1,000. So there are some real financial implications when the federal government doesn't recognize uh, same-sex relationships. And the problem is that with the Defense of Marriage Act and Illinois law is that it creates two separate and distinct uh, set of laws. And that's why uh, going, back to, uh, going back to what I said earlier, um, you know, it's simple, the, the civil union law is simple if you stay within Illinois. As soon as you step out of it, it becomes much more difficult. Um, you know, back to our purposes for what businesses, uh, what businesses need to know, it uh, really comes down to this. If it's a state benefit, if it is a state-sponsored program, then that creates a right for, your, for all civil union partners. If it's a federally pro funded program or if it's a federally administered program, then that right doesn't exist. So going back to what I said, it's, if you want to boil this down into two simple lines, it's this. If you're an employer and you're offering benefits to your employees as spouses, you have to offer those same benefits to the civil union partners, is, uh, to, to, civil, to the, your employees that are entered into a civil union, their spouses. Um, and vice versa, if you're an employee and you see that other people are getting benefits for their spouses, 
then you can ask for those same benefits too for your civil union partner. So I know I have some questions, but before we move on, uh, we will take questions at the end of the night, but does anyone have a question about civil unions for Abrar? Because I guess my question is, this can be very confusing. I'm sure we were all listening, and we'll remember what you said, you know, until we get up tomorrow morning, and then we'll go, what, how did that go again? And right. So, what would, what are the resources, both as an employer, if I, if, as an employer, I want to look things up, and then as an employee to know my rights if I am in a civil union? Well, uh, I'm a lawyer, so I guess your first uh, resource should be your lawyer. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, and, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, there, there are, uh, there are a lot of good organizations out there. I know, like, there's a lot of, um, I, I, I think there, it's Lambda Legal that provides brochures, uh, and explains civil union laws to you, um, even from a business perspective. Um, but uh, again, if you're just talking about Illinois stuff, it really is as simple as making sure you are doing the same thing for your employees' spouses that you were, I'm sorry, that you're doing the same thing for your employees' civil union partners that you were doing for their spouses. If you can s keep that in mind, then I think you'll be compliant with 95% of the laws. The other, the tricky 5% is just when you get into the federal stuff. Um, you know, again, those organizations that are out there like that, they tend to do a pretty, uh, they tend to do a good job of educating you for the most part. Great, thank you. All right, we are now going to move on and talk about elder law. And I'm going to ask Bert to come up. And while he's coming up um, to have this discussion, um, I'm sure that many of us are dealing with not only relatives that are starting to need us various types of assistance, but we're planning for our own futures. Um, the average American is living much longer than before. These are real issues that we have to think about, not only for our own uh, personal lives, but as employees, as managers, and as business owners. And so I've asked Bert to kind of give us some pointers around this subject as well. So Bert? Thank you, Dean. There we go. I knew I'd get it if I kept doing pushing this button. Okay, first, uh, before we actually uh, talk a lot about the elder portion of this, um, elder law is part of a bigger system called estate planning. And in estate planning, you have four essential documents that should be in everybody's estate. A general power of attorney, a medical power of attorney, a living will, and a will. And why are these four documents so important? Well, just so we understand what they each do and how they fit into a total scheme or plan, the general power of attorney allows another person to carry on your financial matters as if you were doing it yourself. Kind of, I guess you could look at it as that's your alter ego. The medical power of attorney gives the right uh, to another party to make sure that you get the proper medical treatment. And the second, I'm going to tell you what the difference between that and a living will is, because a lot of times it's confusing to people and they look at them as one and the same. A living will gives directions for your comfort, your medical assistance, and final wishes. The will distributes your assets, or sometimes they refer to as your treasures, in an orderly plan that you decide on, not the state of Illinois when you don't have a will. You're going to decide who gets what or who doesn't get anything. Okay, now the medical power of attorney is different. That document contemplates that you're going to recover from an illness. Um, maybe you're in a bad accident, you're in intensive care for a while, but you're going to pull through and you're going to live. The living will contemplates that you will not be recovering, and it's a matter of what kind of life support to give somebody for how long. Now, if you enter into these four documents, can you change them at any time? People ask me that all the time. Absolutely. When can you not change them anymore? That's the easier 
question. It's when you're no longer competent, or you know, you hear somebody say, uh, "My aunt is senile now." Okay. Well, at that point, she no longer has the legal capacity to make decisions on uh, either financial or, or uh, estate planning matters. Um, what what can you change? Literally anything. Whatever you want to change, it's up to you. This document is supposed to reflect your wishes. Um, can you help uh, you or your family if you uh, become incapacitated? Well, the answer is once you become incapacitated, you can't do anything. You no longer have a, capa a legal capacity to do anything. Now, this is one of the fastest growing areas today is the financial exploitation of the elderly. And usually the perpetrators of that are another family member, close friend, somebody who is very trusted by you. And this is the fastest growing area of criminal activity. In fact, the Attorney General is just, in Illinois has just passed a new law uh, directly aimed at the financial exploitation of the elderly. And in fact, just recently, within the last couple of weeks, we have two cases that came into the office where a lady is elderly, she's in her late 80s, um, set up, put all her assets into a trust fund. One daughter out of the four is administering it with the, her lawyer. And we've just recently found that there's probably $100,000 that went uh, to pay personal bills of that, that daughter. We call her the bad daughter now. Bought a car for somebody out of the mother's money. Um, paid other people's credit card bills. I mean, you name it. And it's just not unusual today. It's very sad because that lady has no way to replenish that money. And she's just started early onset of Alzheimer's. So not a good situation. And whenever there's money involved and family members, you, you just never know. So uh, that's something that you should be very careful about. So if you have enough money, I always suggest that they have a, a bank do the administering because they're bonded, um, probably more trustworthy. They're less influenced by, you know, three or four hundred thousand dollars sitting in a bank account somewhere. All right, now, what programs are available to help the elderly should there be a problem? Well, I've listed a, a number of them on this slide, and most of these are run by the state of Illinois. However, a lot of the counties, I, I live in Kane County, and I know there are a lot of programs there through the sheriff's office uh, if you have a complaint. Um, one of the two cases I mentioned earlier when I left the office today, they were on their way to the Joliet Police Department to make a report of these thefts. And I'm sure that the lady is probably going to wind up with getting indicted somewhere along the line. So if, if you ever um, need any other information on it, I'm certainly happy to go over that. We'll be available and staying on uh, for a little bit after uh, we get done with the workshop to answer any personal questions you may have. Or you can always pick the phone up and call. You know, we don't charge people. They call up on the phone and say, hey, can you tell me where to go for this or that? We're happy to help out. I know that this topic for me, um, again, I, I'm thinking, you know, at what point do, I mean, is there a certain age you hit where you should be nervous about this? Is it, it, you know, I know that there's a lot of abuse on this in terms of family members and all that. So what should someone, not, not divulging my age, of course, but what should someone at my age be doing to prepare for all of this and to make sure that uh, I'm not going to be taken advantage of by my lovely children or anyone else. <laughs> and of course, not mentioning your age. <laughs> um, I, I think at that stage of the, your stage of the game, which is certainly early, <clears throat> um, I think that what you uh, need to do at that stage is just enter into the four documents that we went over originally. The, the uh, medical power of attorney, the living will, uh, the general power of attorney. And sometimes those two, the medical and the general, are combined into something 
called durable power of attorney. You know, there, there's always more than one term for a lot of these documents that this, different people. I, I see the lady with the red hair has a question. If, if, you're, if you're married, does your spouse or your civil union partner automatically have these powers, the, the general and the durable? I mean, do they need a document to give them the power to handle your financial affairs if you're incapable or make decisions about you medically? Barbara and I will be talking later on the side about <laughs> these sneak questions. <laughs> oh, my God. I know she's getting back at me for something I did. Um, the answer to that question is really simple. Uh, generally, you know, a spouse uh, always has an inherent um, legal ability to uh, get her husband medical treatment. Let's say he's out in an automobile, winds up plowing his car into a tree, wife comes to the hospital. They're certainly going to let her sign for that. But today, um, medical providers, whether it's a hospital, uh, one of those 24-hour care facilities, whatever it is, have gotten very picky about that because um, they don't really know that that's your wife. The guy's unconscious there on the, on the table, and they really love to see paperwork. Um, since the new HIPAA laws have come in, that medical power of attorney that we used to do used to be, I think, two and a half pages long. I think it's now like nine or 11 pages long um, just to comply with that. They like to see people's names in it so that they can flip through it and see the name and verify it. And what they're really afraid of isn't so much providing medical treatment to some injured party. It's having the real spouse come in and sue them for something. And, you know, in our country, I mean, people sue people at the drop of a hat including uh, any kind of, whatever business you're in, you're always exposed to something like that. And we're, we're going to talk about that in a little while when we do the business succession planning. Um, but today you just, you can't be too careful. But the simple answer is yes, there's an inherent legal ability to do that. You know, I think the question would come up be a little harder if it was one of these civil unions where you have the same sex. I think People in the hospital see a man and a wife. They think marriage, maybe. They see a couple wedding rings. Who knows? Uh, I think that would be a, a tougher one to sell to them, if you will. They don't know if that's just a friend off the street or, you know, it could be your cousin, could be anybody. Any other trick questions? Can a family simply decide that Aunt Betsy is senile? Can what? Can a family... Or, or, you know, relatives simply decide on their own that Aunt Betsy is senile? You know, I really am going to talk to her later. <laughs> I just want to know, you know, her presentation is next, and I'm going to start writing those questions down as soon as I sit down. Um, well, actually, that topic exactly was just the uh, topic of a seminar held at the State of Illinois building by what's called the Attorney Registration Disciplinary Committee. And they went over a lot of examples. Uh, uh, two daughters bring their mother in to the lawyer to do these documents we talked about. And the one daughter says, you know, my mother's been acting strange lately. I'm not sure she's really all with it anymore. Um, there is absolutely a duty, an absolute duty of that lawyer to almost interrogate that lady to make sure that he is sure in his mind that she does have the faculties uh, uh, to enter into these documents. But in the case of who, who makes that decision, certainly the lawyer shouldn't be making that decision because he doesn't usually have any medical training. I mean, there are lawyers that also were doctors. Uh, I think there's four of them in the state of Illinois now. But um, you should certainly take uh, whoever that person is uh, to a medical professional, whether that is a doctor who now specializes in elderly law, uh, or it's a uh, psychologist, or, but somebody trained in that field, so that you can get a written report that, yes, there's early onset of Alzheimer's, there's 
some cognitive ability is being affected uh, or diminished capacity. And then it's a question, what's the degree of it? Has it reached a point where they can't make those decisions? So at that point, uh, that lady can't sign any legal documents because she doesn't have the capacity to understand what she's signing. And it would certainly be um, wrong of a lawyer to ask them to sign that or any other person for that matter. So I had a friend who had a, her grandmother um, became senile and I'm not sure how her aunt became power of attorney. Was it, you know, I didn't know if her grandmother granted her that or, you know, prior to her losing full capacity to make decisions. But um, so the aunt ended up like changing the property into her name. The other children had no idea what was going on. So I know that she was, you know, primarily um, responsible for her medical care. So I'm sure she went and had everything changed without the other children knowing at the time. What legal rights would they have, if any, in a case like that? Well, one thing I want to point out is you mentioned the other children didn't know any of this is going on. There, there really is no duty uh, to inform those other children uh, that she the lady has exercised the power that she holds to make those transfers. So that in and of itself it doesn't really mean a lot. I mean, it could be indicative of somebody with the uh, financial exploitation that we were just talking about, certainly. Um, so there's no duty to do that. Okay, now what's the other half of your question? I think I only asked, was it? They have no, they would have, a, I mean, given that they were at one point, you know, property and she changed it. Well see that that's one of the biggest things going on now is you know hey you know I was going to inherit that property and now you went and changed it to so-and-so's name and uh, this entitlement to these inheritances I, I frankly don't know where that comes from um, you know my father has been dead for 25 years and uh, frankly I hope my mother spends every nickel of it and has a good time. But the entitlement thing is very popular today. It's a big issue. Um, however, um, that transferring around of all the property, if there isn't a legitimate legal reason to have to do that, she may be abusing that power. And they may then have the right to go in front of a judge and have him order to have those transactions reversed. And that's one of the things we're doing in the case down in Joliet is there were transfers of different pieces of real estate for absolutely no legal reason whatsoever except they went into some other strange person's name and we're seeking to have those reversed as well. So Very common though. Thank you. It's a good question. Okay. And if you enjoyed Bert, he'll be back a little later in the panel to talk about succession planning. So thanks, Bert. Uh, so I'm going to ask Barbara, Barbara Riley to come up and talk about marriage and divorce. And, you know, I have to say, my husband was a little nervous about what precipitated my interest in this topic, but I assured him that this was just uh, for academic purposes. So go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to start with some real basic concepts. This might sound funny, but believe it or not, young people today, I'm fine, do not understand do not understand that all money, all income acquired when you're married is marital property. You know, you've, you've all been to religious ceremonies, you know, they take two candles, they light one candle, you know, but you are a legal entity when you are married. If you get divorced, the, the legal papers say, in re marriage of, you know, you are one. So, all, so young people now think, well, this is my paycheck, and that's his paycheck, and sometimes they even keep their own checking accounts. It doesn't matter. It is all marital property. Um, therefore, when you go to get unmarried or uncivil union, I don't know what the proper time, so it sounds like you're saying the same thing, Abra. It's all common property. Home, pensions. Young people, too, they do not. It's my pension. You hear them say that, my pension. Oh, yeah? Well, if that, let's say you were married for 10 years, 
No, you were, you were single for 10 years. Then you got married, and you were married for 20 years. When you quit that employer after 30 years, two-thirds of that pension is marital property and is subject to division between the parties. Okay? Investments, lawsuits. You know, so if you're married and you get hit by a bus and you sue the bus company and you get $100,000, marital property. Same thing with workman's comp. Businesses gets tricky. I think investments are pretty clear, you know, if it's investments made with marital money. So you think, well, you know, I took my money, you know, like let's say your employer has, you know, stock option program or whatever. Nope. Th that anything that you make with your marital money is marital property and subject to division. There are exceptions. The big one is gifts or inheritance, okay? Those are exceptions. So the trick here is to keep it separate, okay? So if a young person, let's say a young person has a trust fund and they get married and their trust fund is kept off in a separate account Maybe they take the interest from that trust and bring it into their marriage and use it to live on or take trips on or whatever. If it's kept separate in a trust, and we'll get to this later when we talk about protecting your own assets, as long as it's kept separate, it stays non-marital. But let's just say you've been married 10 years, your mother dies, you inherit $100,000, and you decide that you're going to buy a new home guess what? You've just turned it into marital property. So the trick here to think is to keep it separate. Um, there's such a thing as a legal separation where you get legally, your, your, you know, the biggest thing about legal separation is it stops the accrual of marital property. We find a lot of elderly people getting legal separations for, for whatever reason, they might need to stay technically married because maybe you don't even have to be that old, come to think of it, to get um, insurance benefits. You, you know, what, what if you, you know, are using your husband's insurance? You might want to stay married. Um, you can't marry anyone else, but it stops the accrual of marital property. You can also agree. You can agree that your husband's baseball collection is his alone. You, you can make agreements while you're married. You don't have to do them just before. And increases in non-marital property. So suppose your father left you a plot of land on a lake. You know, when your father bought that back in the 1940s for $10,000, and now it's on a lake, so it's worth $100,000. It's, it's still non-marital because it was an increase in your non-marital property. Same thing, what if your dad left you a two-flat? You know, the income from that non-marital property would be non-marital, ah, unless it could be subject to contribution. What if you used marital money to uh, put a new roof on? What if you use marital money to pay the taxes? It can all be figured out. But those are the, the big exceptions to marital property. And anything before you got married. You know, if you, if you owned a piece of property before you got married, or what you're interested in here is if you had a business before you got married. You know, non-marital property. I don't know if this is going to be something you're interested in closely held businesses. This basically means a business held within a family, you know, as opposed to, you know, I don't know, Morton Salt, looking out the window. But um, the easiest thing to do here is to offset it with other assets, you know, to give the business only to one person. Usually it's coming down from somebody's family. So one of the parties has more of an interest in the business than the other. Um, a big thing then becomes evaluation. How do you value what, what this business is? Are we talking about a hairdresser salon? You know, what is that business worth? Or are we talking about a mustard company? I mean, there's, it's very hard to make general pronouncements about this because every situation is so different. But business valuation becomes a very big and sometimes very costly deal 
in a, a divorce or a civil union breakup. Um, and the, uh, the last part is it is needs to be valued at the date of the divorce or whatever. Um, I have some other things here. The statistics vary. We all know the divorce rate's very high. I mean, I read something preparing for this not long ago that said it was 60%. You know, when people get divorced and they're in their 20s, planning for divorce is not part of their mind. To begin, when they're in their 20s, they usually don't even have anything to worry about, you know? The older you get, the more you start seeing things that come down the line. You know, the whole topic of this is asset protection. Well, it's hard to protect your assets unless you plan ahead of time. That's kind of the bottom line. Prenuptial agreements, I mean, you've heard of them. They're not just for movie stars, you know. They're for anybody with anything to protect. Lots of times you have people now getting married, second marriages, they're still young, but they have children from a first marriage. It can get complicated, and thinking down the line makes it easier for everybody. And to have enough forethought, if you remember nothing else, keep inherited money separate. You know, it will help. I think before you even call lawyers if you're contemplating divorce, if you are using an accountant, call your accountant. It's all about money. Um, there's something called an um, affidavit of assets and liabilities. It's a dreadful instrument. Everyone getting divorced has to do it. If you ever get divorced, just do it as soon as you can. It will really help you lay out your assets, your liabilities, the records that you need. Records get to be huge. Um, records of debts, records of bills. If you have anything about, you know, you know, it's starting to happen, at least in, in, in my generation, heirlooms. You've got stuff that your parents gave you. You watched your Antiques Roadshow. You never know what anything's worth. But it's nice to catalog things. I know this sounds like icky stuff to do when you've got nothing better to do. But if you are in a position where divorce is going to intrude in your life, the biggest thing to do is to be aware, not stick your head in the sand and keep track of your finances. If any of you are interested, I've got a check sheet you can use. I made copies if you have any questions. Questions, but first, to, I, I was going to say, anyone else have a question? Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and bring the mic over to you and go ahead and pass that down. I am not married, however, I do desire to get married one day. So, a question um, that I have would be if you d did get divorced, how would um, any debt be, like, for example, credit card debt? Okay. No, you don't. But that is some, the question is, do you take on the debt of someone when you marry them? The answer is no. But what if the credit card carried right on? You know, the credit card company, you, legal or not, whatever happens in domestic relations court, a credit card company might very well come after you, you know? And honestly, someone's credit history I always tell young women, hmm, you know, their driving record, their criminal background, and their credit check, because it will tell you so much about them. <laughs> so, oh, we have another question over here. Hi. My question, I'm retired. I do get a pension. Now, if I married someone tomorrow, would they be entitled to my pension? From what I've seen of the pension laws, no. You have to, before, you know, when I was on the bench, you know, when I was still a judge, I had a pension. I had to tell them that I was married. They then took out lots more money out of my pension because I was married, okay? And that's to, that's to pay for the extra expense. If I die, then my spouse would get a pension. But because that wasn't done ahead of time with you, okay, it's that, that doesn't go to um, domestic relations law. That would be the law of pensions. And the answer is no. So I have a question. So if you have a business before you get married and, um, and your business goes under, 
or you get sued as a business owner and that lawsuit is still in progress and you get married in the middle of all that, which sounds like a nightmare in and of itself, right? Um, what liability does your spouse take or not take in that situation? I would think it would depend on just how involved in the business the spouse was. And after that, I'm going to like lock this right <laughs> to him. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it's just because she's the tallest one in our office. And she, she has a superiority complex there. Um, the answer to that is, uh, and we were discussing this a little earlier on something else, if uh, that spouse signed contracts in her own capacity without the proper designation, if she was the one maybe that placed uh, orders for materials, let's say it's a construction company, and signed for them, the creditor could say that she was acting on her own outside of the company and therefore have some liability. But in general, the answer would be none. As long as the formalities on running things, she's an employee, she took part of it. Maybe uh, I've seen a lot of spouses are the bookkeepers. Um, I think probably because they like to know what's coming in and what's going out. Going out, but uh, so they have some hands-on experience, but that doesn't in and of itself create any liability whatsoever. You know, credit cards are a little different. Um, there's something called the family expense statute, and if, uh, let's say, Michelle and her husband go out and they buy a new bedroom set, a new dining room set, and then they, they don't pay the credit card company, they could, and the husband's the only one, of course, that signed the credit card slip, because uh, Michelle had to go get her hair done or something, uh, and wasn't there, but... Um, the family expense statute says that if it was for food, clothing, or shelter, that both parties would then be liable for it. But that, that's really an exception to all this. In general, the answer would be probably no liability. I will talk to Barbara about the first call being the accountant. So, uh, so as Bert's getting up to come back up and talk about succession planning, I, I'll just offer up a little anecdote. So uh, back several years ago, a friend of the family, uh, our family, uh, was married and won the lottery. Well, actually, the, the situation was that her husband had bought a lottery ticket in another state, and it, it came in. He won 50, or $42 million dollars. And so, right, where is he now? And so that's the interesting, so, so like, many, like many statistics around lottery winners, you know, a lot of people end up getting divorced, right? And so, you know, they already probably were headed that way and they did get divorced, but you can bet they split that money 50-50. So there you have it, right? All right, so, so <laughs> you don't have it, that's right. Still had plenty to go around if you ask me, but... Um, so Bert is going to talk about succession planning next. And, uh, you know, this is important whether you uh, are in a family business, uh, you own a business, you're thinking about starting a business. Uh, and so I'm going to let him give you some pointers on that. You know, what, before I get started, one other question on that lottery issue. There was another case in Illinois at a well-known divorce firm. They had proved up the judgment. Um, and the husband went out and he won $19 million in the lottery and the judge had not signed the judgment, went on vacation. And, <laughs> and of course, as soon as uh, the wife found out, because his name was all over the Tribune with his picture, um, right away it's, where's my half? And probably more like, where's my 60%? <laughs> So, and that went all the way through the appellate court, and they continuously ruled right down the chain that, yep, that was marital property, and they hadn't been divorced yet. So, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, that husband has a real hate for the judge that went on vacation. <laughs> Anyways, uh, moving on to uh, business succession planning. Um, the, fir the first title, I, Will Your Business Survive You?, well, what about what will happen to your business when you retire, you become disabled, or when you pass away? Um, you know, 
a lot of times, uh, if you're retiring, you want to you want to have your oldest son maybe take over the business, your oldest daughter, maybe both of your sons jointly. So that that's something that we always suggest, rather than somebody just unilaterally making a decision they have a family meeting about. I think that, that gets rid of a lot of the uh, unhappiness when uh, one child thinks the father is favoring another. And how? what about me? I worked there for 15 years, too. What if you become disabled? Now, you know, that doesn't mean totally incapacitated, but um, what if you have a stroke or a, a heart attack and uh, you have some kind of physical disability? You just don't want to, it's a hard physical job. You don't want to be a part of it anymore. Or, of course, when you pass away, and when you pass away, that's where all these wills come into effect uh, to lay out your, your wishes in an orderly plan. And you have to consider that. That's something that would be in a will. Now, questions you need to ask yourself if you're a business owner uh, would be, uh, when do I want to leave the business? Um, I know Alice over here wants to leave the business as soon as she reaches 49. And uh, <laughs> nothing like picking up points, is there, with that? <laughs> uh, other people want to leave the business when they're 65 or they have some goal. They want to work till they're 72 uh, because of Social Security for some reason. Uh, how do I want to leave the business? And that doesn't mean on a stretcher. <laughs> <laughs> that can mean, do I want to leave the business? Do I want to leave it in the hands of uh, my children? Do I want to leave it in the hands of maybe even your spouse? Uh, or a trusted employee who's been with you for uh, 37 and a half years uh, and you think has really earned the right? Uh, to whom do I want to gift uh, or sell the business? This is something, too, that would most probably be in a will. Uh, especially the part about uh, to whom do I want to gift it to. There aren't a lot of people today, especially in our economy, that want to just gift a business to somebody. They're looking to do the other half of that sentence, sell the business. Um, how, how do I fund the transfer? You know, a lot of times uh, if we did a uh, business succession plan, sometimes uh, it would be funded uh, by the company itself. In other words, they have a great cash flow, the employee, that wants to buy out the owner when they retire doesn't have a lot of money uh, for one reason or another. So uh, the seller might let them fund it out of the cash flow of the business itself because he's confident the employee will keep working hard in the business, trying to make it grow so that cash flow will probably continue. And maybe you don't have any other prospective buyers. Or maybe it's to reward that employee for being a good, honest, and reliable employee for 37 and a half years. How do I avoid family disputes? Well, that's the thing I was saying. Um, if you're smart, you get everybody together and you have a family meeting and you have an actual discussion about it. Some people, uh, their attitude is, well, you know, I don't really need it. I'm the boss. I don't need to discuss that with anybody. I'm the head of the family. I'll make the final decision whether you like it or not. Well, that, that is a surefire way to cause a lot of aggravation in the family and a lot of grief. And my suggestion from seeing this in real life is you have the family meeting. Whether it comes out good or bad, you still have the meeting. Okay, this is all about three things. The three C's, I call it. Uh, control, choice, and continuity. The last one, I think, is one of the most important, the continuity. Because you don't want to break that. You've got a going business. Uh, it's a window company. Been going for 73 years. You want to keep that ball rolling. So you want continuity in the transfer. You want it to be seamless to outsiders uh, so they don't even uh, notice it's happening. Uh, the control is uh, who's going to be in charge, who's going to be in control, and your choice of, of who that's going to be. And there's the uh, two sons shaking hands with the mother who inherited the business from her husband. Um, you should always, without exception, have a written buy-sell agreement. Um, you know, in Illinois and in every state, there are two kinds of agreements, oral and written. And they're both very enforceable, except the problem is, uh, if you have an oral agreement, there's always an argument over exactly what the terms were. 
If you put it in writing, there's no argument. It's right there in black and white. Um, you might have an interpretation problem, but the term is there. Um, this, this protects everybody, including the owners, the heirs. Uh, if there's a written buy-sell agreement, what happens if one of the two owners uh, passes away? They have a heart attack driving home from work one night and they die. Uh, at least this way you have it in writing. There's no dispute over what the deal is. And it'll, you want it to say who has the right to buy, who is selling, when will they buy or sell, certain age limits, um, when the business reaches a certain point, um, when somebody maybe gets divorced, uh, it could trigger a buy-sell agreement. Because I'll tell you one thing, a surviving partner or the remaining partner sure doesn't want to inherit as his new partner somebody else's wife. They might get along fine, they might not. And, but it's certainly not his choice. If you're going to be somebody's partner, it should be your choice to, to be that partner and to pick and choose who it's going to be. And then, of course, we have the price. What price will they sell? Well, in today's economy, you know, it's not practical to set a, a real price. Um, you're going to have to have it, uh, a business valuation done, as Barbara said earlier. Um, you hire a professional who goes around valuing businesses because they're going to take into consideration not just your general gross sales for the year, but uh, maybe the goodwill. A uh, company's been around for 73 years, built up a lot of goodwill, got a decent reputation. How much is that worth? Um, and they can take into consideration different market trends, and it's a lot more accurate. Uh, yeah, it'll be a little expensive doing that, but it's just part of the cost of buying and selling a business. Okay, we talked a little bit about this a few minutes ago. Um, you can uh, fund this buy-sell by paying out of the cash flow of the actual business. Uh, maybe the family who's buying uh, can borrow the funds. Maybe the family who's selling would be willing to enter into a loan agreement with the, the purchaser. And they'd sign a written note for it and all the other financial documents. Or maybe the uh, selling family goes to somebody's bank and they sign a guarantee for the loan to the buyer. Uh, that's not that uncommon. Um, the company uh, can save up for it. Uh, you can arrange to buy the business interest under uh, installment payments. There's almost anything you can create can work. Um, you certainly want some security for that. Um, and you can uh, acquire key man insurance um, on any of the, the founders or the key people in the company uh, they would buy them out uh, and pay off their estate for their interest in the company. So again, so you don't wind up having a partner that you're not, that you didn't pick and choose. The death of the owner, well, obviously we have the benefits of life insurance. Life insurance companies always have a lot of money. They're great to deal with. Uh, so you never have to worry whether the person is going to have the money or not. It provides cash prevents a drain on the business profits. So maybe you can't always pay it out of uh, cash flow. Um, you may have high inventory costs to pay. Uh, maybe the market's slowing down. Um, if you're in the window business, uh, construction in the Chicago area is, is very slow these days. So, you know, not a good turnover. Um, it helps to uh, uh, turn that asset into uh, some kind of liquidity so you can use that. And uh, the death benefit in the policy can be used uh, to increase um, and reflect the growth of the business. Um, all right, now we come to disability income. This is the one where somebody's sitting at their desk, they have a stroke, and they're, they're kind of partially incapacitated. Maybe they're paralyzed on one side. So they really um, can't perform their jobs every day. Uh, maybe they're a construction supervisor, so now they can't go out on job sites anymore because it's not physically practical. And this, this helps pay them their salary while they're on disability or maybe for the rest of their life uh, instead of the company paying the benefits. Buy-sell agreements, you always want to have the redemption, um, the cross-purchase, uh, and the unilateral, unilateral purchase by a uh, key employee or a family member who's not currently in the business or they may be working in the business. <clears throat> uh, 
I think this one kind of uh, speaks for itself. It assures that the business is transferred to the fair market value. And this is the uh, benefits of a funded uh, buy-sell. Uh, ties the key people to the, the business, helps promote competent successors. People that know how to manage the company are already there, and now they've got money to take care of things. Okay. Where do we go from here? Um, well, you want to go and talk to a professional that does these kind of things. The first thing that they'll want to know is what's on your wish list. So when you go in to talk to somebody, you should always have your wish list out or at least formulated. Um, they'll help you uh, discuss what choices you might have based on your wish list. Uh, and they'll help tell you this is how we implement the strategy to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Okay. And I'm going to give this right back to our moderator. But I think we have a question from one of our fellow panelists. So before he starts uh, with his presentation, Bob's going to ask you a question. Bert, uh, for paying the buy-sell out of the company's profits, wouldn't that be a, a tax problem for the company? Or would it be better for the employee to pay it out of his pocket? I think the answer is it's always better to have the employee pay for it. Uh, at least I think the IRS thinks so. And, but the problem is um, they don't always have the money. I think in that case you could almost loan, the company could loan the, the purchaser the money, uh, get a note back evidencing the loan, and then they could use that money to buy the company and so they'd have their money back as a purchase price. Uh, and that would be some way to funnel the money to the purchaser. Uh, it's a little tricky with the paperwork, but I think that would probably get the job done. Uh, Barbara didn't tell you the asset, did she? So as, as Bob is uh, making his way over to the podium, uh, I have to say I'm stressed out just uh, trying to you know, think about all of these things tonight. And, uh, and, I, and I don't own several businesses uh, like someone like Bob. Um, and so We've asked him to speak a little bit about how do we manage stress when we've got to deal with so many complications, legal and otherwise, in our lives because, uh, you know, I'm sure you read the papers and there are plenty of situations where due to the stress in people's lives, they kind of, they hit the tipping point and it can get violent, ugly, difficult at work. So the more that we can find ways to be healthy, to live um, stress, a little less stress, or ideally stress-free, uh, the better we're going to be able to reason through a lot of these issues. So, Bob? Thank you, Dean. As an owner of several businesses, I can say that these last few years have been extremely challenging. I've worked and coached CEOs, doctors, attorneys, and many other business people. In my own life, I found many helpful tools that kept my energy high and my stress low. This subject affects all of us in this room. Stress management, a simple approach for the business person. Stress can lead to poor decisions, can result in a lawsuit. Stress relievers can play an important role in making clear, smart decisions to minimize bad choices. The things that I found to help me in my businesses that I've collected over the years was three things that are extremely important to my life, and that would be exercise, eating properly, and proper sleep. Now, I know none of this sounds new to y'all. Y'all probably heard it before. This is extremely important that you hear it again. Taking care of yourself is not part of a business plan. How many people here set goals for and strategically plan for their companies? Anybody in here? Good. Does anyone here also plan for their personal development for health? Do you take time to do that also? Great. That's something that you should do. And a lot of people are finding that they don't have the time to do it. Take care of yourself is not an option. It is equally as important as the company's strategic plan and yearly goals. If you don't take care of yourself, nobody else will. With our good health, life can be, without good health, life can be very difficult. The biggest question that I get asked myself is, why exercise? Well, there's a lot of answers to that question. Number one, for your heart. Your heart obviously pumps blood through your whole system. And it's a muscle, so it has to be exercised. 
So exercise in this body part sends blood all the way through your body and through your brain. The more blood that gets to the brain, the sharper you are. So that's very important. Exercise increases energy. You look better, feel better, have a positive attitude. You increase self-esteem. You think clearer, it also avoids colds. Uh, can decrease, in, decrease symptoms like chronic diseases such as diabetes and high blood pressure. And as Michelle mentioned earlier, there's a couple of uh, uh, ads, not ads, but a couple things in the Tribune sh stating that stress is becoming a very big problem with corporate. And in my businesses, it is very, very stressful. The successful business person includes exercise in their schedule. They prioritize health, manage stress, eat and drink for nourishment, not for comfort. You don't sit on the couch with a bag of potato chips and a Diet Coke. That doesn't work. Plan for their meals and make smart choices. They provide their body with rest, and they know their body. Let's start at work. First of all, you could take a walk during lunch, listen to music. You can uh, call someone that makes you happy. Breathing techniques, breathing through the nose and out through the mouth. That would be very helpful. That relaxes the system. Close your office door for 10 minutes and relax. Do some stretching. Do some stretching in it. Take your golf club and do some putting in your office. Uh, drink plenty of water. Stay hydrated. That's also extremely important. Our body is 60% uh, water. And a lot of people maybe don't realize that. Eight cups a day, eight ounces. That's extremely important to drink. Uh, it flushes our toxins. It, it lubricates our joints. It regulates body temperature. Uh, stay away from the energy drinks if you can. That's a lot of caffeine and a lot of sugar. So you go up when you drink and then you crash down. Take time to work out during lunch if you can. Uh, walk instead of taking a cab. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. There's a lot of little things that you can do that are extremely important in staying healthy. Eating is also another important factor. Now I'm sure a lot of you have little refrigerators in your office. Who knows what's in them? But I'll tell you, what you should be having in them is water, fruit, vegetables, uh, nuts, uh, yogurt, uh, carrots, granola bars. So these are things that you should have during breakfast, lunch, and then from lunch to dinner. You also should have a breakfast too. Have vitamin B and fiber. This way at 11 o'clock you don't want to have a donut. So there's a lot of things that you can do to make yourself have the energy you need during the day and not to get tired at 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon wanting to fall asleep. 43% uh, of the people out there that have stress usually eat too much. And when they eat too much, they get tired, and they're not, it's a lot of junk food out there. What I would suggest you do, get an assessment. Go to the doctor, get your blood pressure checked, check, check your cholesterol. Determine your health status. That's extremely important. Develop your own exercise plan. It requires a lot of work, but it can be done. Go to a gym, check it out. Walk into a gym and see if that's something you can do. Talk to a personal trainer. That's also something you do. Now, you don't have to work in a gym or work out in a gym. You can go work out of your home. I have quite a few clients I go right to their home. Either they have children or they just don't like to be in a gym. And that's something that a lot more people are doing. Employers, there's a lot of wellness programs out there. Big companies are getting involved with it and little companies are getting involved with it. When you have $2.2 .2 trillion in uh, nationwide health care costs, that's a lot of money. Each one of us in a company, they pay over $9,000 each a year for this service. So companies are getting involved with this wellness program, which has been very successful for a lot of companies. Uh, you can have uh, healthy eating counselors come in and talk to your employees. You can have a personal trainer come in and talk to your employees. Uh, give so much off on a club uh, package, a health club package. Uh, once a week, bring in some fruit. Make sure there's a lot of water. You okay? Uh, have a contest between the sales department and HR department so you can burn the most calories in 30 days. There's a lot of programs you can have here. Go to kickboxing classes. Offer uh, dancing lessons. My wife and I have been dancing for two years, and I'll tell you, it makes a difference. And you meet a lot of good people. Have cooking classes. Have someone come in and teach people how to cook healthy. So th this is just the beginning of, of what can happen if you take it upon yourself as employers to do things. It also increases productivity from the employees. They work harder. They reduce uh, health costs for you. They lower turnover. The morale is a lot higher. The camaraderie is up. 
So it increases revenues. That's the most important thing for most of us as owners of businesses. Sleep, proper sleep. Seven, eight hours usually is normal. Some people need more, some people need less. But I'll tell you, the brain uh, catalogs previous day's experience, previous day's experience. So the brain has to rest, and it primes your memory. So without the rest, the next day you're not hitting on all eight. So it's important to get the rest that you need because your productivity will hit bottom. Also, you can lose a few pounds sleeping, which is something that most people aren't aware of. Have a good night's sleep, get some REM sleep, and you can lose one or two pounds. <clears throat> Try these ideas, they work. Stress is part of our lives. How you handle it is up to you. Just think what you could do with less stress and more energy. Do everything in moderation. Thank you. Any questions at all? Yes, Bert. <laughs> Bob, the other the other day, um, we or last week or so, we had dinner, and I ordered uh, when the waiter came a a diet coke, and I got this look, like, are you really going to drink that? And what what is that? I noticed a number of people have pop cans, including me with a diet Pepsi, and what what is it with the pop that you were giving me the look on? It. Well, what I find, uh, you could probably clean uh, a bumper on a car with some of this Diet Coke, Diet Pop stuff. Um, I find it uh, doesn't agree with your system. It, it, uh, water is obviously healthier. Uh, it's just if everything in moderation, as I said. You can have a pizza every other, uh, once a week. You can do a lot of things. And I was pulling your chain a little bit there, Bert. But uh, once in a while, it's okay. It's just that if you have it every time you, you eat, that's a problem. It's too much sugar, uh, and that's not good, especially if you're a diabetic, which I'm sure you're not, but it's not healthy. Any, any other questions? Questions for Bob? Yes, over here. Did you just say uh, the regular pop is better than the diet pop? No. In general, water is better than pop, right? <laughs> In general, water is better. It keeps you full. That doesn't quench your thirst. Uh, I know people that have drinking two, three cans a day, and it's just a habit. And I'm not saying to stop cold turkey. You know, just cut back a little bit, and you'll find yourself with more energy because that does give you a little sluggish. You slow down a little bit. So um, we're going to go ahead and take some uh, final questions from the panel uh, with the panel. Before we do, Bob, I have a question for you as, as you just wrapped up. Um, so I know that uh, you've talked about things that we can do as uh, individuals, and I'd like to think a little bit more about, so some of the things you talked about we could do in the office, and I think that that would be very helpful. Um, as an employer yourself, some of us may be managers of other people. We might own our own businesses. What are some things that you would suggest that we do as managers to support our employees in, in being healthy? Well, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of things you can get as far as getting them in health clubs, uh, sponsor things that, uh, and get, have contests, have things that more people can get involved. Of course, it's all voluntary. You can't force anyone to do anything at all. I mean, that's not the right thing to do. But if you have camaraderie or, uh, say, um, uh, Bert and I work, work out together, we, we push each other to do the workout, that's been very popular. Uh, if you have uh, things in common with uh, horseback riding, uh, that's very healthy. There's a lot of things that people don't realize are healthy uh, that they think they have to go to a gym like it used to be years ago and stay in there an hour and lift heavy weights. That's gone. I can come to a home with a Swiss ball and, a, and, and no weights at all and help people. So there's a lot of things you could do sit in your office that people don't, aren't aware of. That's why I say go to a personal trainer, go somewhere or go to your doctor, someone that can help you. I mean, just sitting here, you know, there's things I can do that you wouldn't even know I'm doing that would help my body, my core. So it's important to, I have an open door policy at my company, so people come in and talk anytime they want, and you've got to make people aware of things, but you can't force them. Yes. There's one thing, I, and all the speakers that we failed to mention that I think from a legal standpoint for managers and business owners that they should really be aware of. All these different questions about uh, benefits for civil unions, um, 
how can we help the healthy, uh, make the employees more healthy with the, um, well, well, we'll pay part of the health, uh, the health club uh, membership, uh, maybe have a train. I know there's a, a company downtown called General Growth, which is huge. It's a multi-billion dollar company, and they have a huge area that they provide for their, all their employees on their lunch hour to go up and work out uh, right like in their own building. And office policy manual is the key to not getting sued over a lot of these benefits and stuff. If you're going to offer to uh, pay like 50% of a health club membership on a certain level, it should be in the office policy manual because you may only want to offer that to people who have been with the company for 10 years uh, as a perk. Um, you might offer um, spousal insurance benefits to anybody who's been there more than three years. And you want to set all of these things out in an office policy manual because otherwise um, you could be the subject of a discrimination claim, an unfair business practice, um, not treating your employees equally. Uh, but the key to that, and not only having the office policy manual, which is usually in the personnel uh, department's office, it's not given out that employees take home. It's a proprietary document that remains within the, the four walls of the company, but is available for employees to look at. You should have, we always tell clients that ask about that, that the, when the employee is hired, they're given some time to review it. And the, here's your copy, take a look at it. And when they're done, they have to sign a statement saying that they were given it to look at, they reviewed it, and then you do the same thing when you make amendments to it or changes to it. And believe me, it gets rid of a lot of potential heartache and a lot of aggravation that could come, not to mention legal expense. I just wanted to add that. To that. No, I, I think that's right. I was also thinking, uh, I had two other comments related to, to both of your comments. Um, First of all, Kendall is uh, starting a Weight Watchers club here, and so you know we recognize how important it is to to try to be healthy and all of that. And a lot of companies have those sorts of programs. Um, I think where some companies are struggling maybe with where the line is. Um, one of our students in the business program did a paper a couple quarters ago about some of the uh, moves from incentives to requirements at companies that, you know, to, even to the extreme where you are weigh, you have to weigh in and you have, you know, certain requirements about, uh, you know, similar to health policies, where do you smoke or are you over a certain weight and things like that. And that's where I think there's still probably a lot that's going to shake out legally uh, before, uh, before too much longer because th those sorts of issues have got to be pretty hot in terms of lawsuit potential, I would think. Um, and so uh, I, my last question before I ask each panelist to kind of give some closing thoughts is for Abrar, who's, who started off first and then patiently uh, listened uh, along with all of us. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Judge Judy. So just to bring a little more pop culture into this. And... Um, I, I laugh because she continuously gets frustrated and has to lecture people who cohabitate because when they choose to, you know, one moves out or one doesn't, is upset about something and uh, she says, this is the problem that you didn't have a legal document uh, related to your arrangement. And I say this question is also for Barbara. So whether it's, it's someone who is, is gay or straight, what are the advantages, what are the dis are there disadvantages to entering into a marriage or a civil union versus cohabitating? Um, yeah, I mean, that problem exists a lot, and especially with uh, younger couples, uh, people of my generation, uh, you know, who choose to live together first prior to marriage or prior to entering a civil union, and the it's really that simple. You just don't get any benefits. You get no protection from cohabitating, period. Um, Illinois doesn't recognize common law marriages, so you may have had a marriage ceremony in a church or a mosque or a temple, but that's still not a marriage until you go get a marriage license. It's still not a civil union until you go get a civil union, and uh, you get zero protection unless you go document the fact that you're married or in a civil union. 
I mean, it's just really that simple. Couldn't agree more. And sometimes that's good news and sometimes that's bad news. Like what if somebody has a lot of debt? You know, you know, we were talking earlier about getting in a relationship with somebody with debt. Sometimes it's good not to be, you know, snarled up with them. But again, there's no protection. Right. You know, um, you're just like roommates. Right. And they're, you know. All right, so I'm going to ask you to, to go down the line, and we'll go uh, right from this direction. And that way, Bob, you get the opportunity to think about the final closing remarks for the night. So go ahead. Um, well, thank you for hosting, first of all. Uh, I, we've had a, I've had a great time at Kendall College, and um, I appreciate the opportunity. When it comes to civil unions, um, just be sure to, it's like I said earlier, if I haven't hammered it at home, I'll hammer it at home one more time. If you're an employer, make sure you offer those benefits that you offer to spouses that you do to uh, civil union partners and vice versa. If you're an employee who's entered into a civil union, seek out those benefits for your partner that's offered to other employees. I think one thought is from both the elder law discussion, the business succession planning is, in today's day and age, whatever your wishes are, you've got to put it in writing. You have to have written agreements on everything. You have to have proper legal documents. There's no more taking a chance on this happening or that happening if I just tell my oldest son to do this or that if anything happens to me. You must have everything today in writing. It's the only way to do it. Oh, I have one question of the dean, though. Is this Weight Watchers program equally available for the males at uh, Kendall College? It absolutely is. I can, I, I, there are other staff members here that can affirm it is open. And in fact, you know, we probably would let people outside the college come to our meetings if they are so inclined. <laughs> I wonder what that message is. <laughs> says, uh, I die broke. Do I still need to have anything in, in writing? I have nothing. Well, everybody has something. And you uh, mentioned earlier that uh, you're a pensioner. And uh, if you check with your pension company, I don't know where your pension comes from, but uh, or who your former employer was, but a lot of times there are benefits that, that uh, survive you. Uh, that can be given to uh, relatives or friends. Just to fr it could be the guy next door uh, that you walk his dog from. Yeah, I, I thought you were going to say that you don't think I need Weight Watchers, and I was going to move you up to number one. But uh, so everybody has something, and if that's the case, and you do want something to be done with it according to the way you want it done then yes, you should put it in writing. It's simple and it's not expensive. It can be a simple document. All right, Barbara? Also, end of life issues. You will have those too, you know? So it's nice to have your wishes documented, okay? It, it just, and you know, there's something, um, uh, go online and look up something called Five Wishes. I mean, you, you don't really need to have lawyers who spend a lot of money to make your, your wishes known. I'm just saying. Um, back to, you know, <laughs> there's, um, this modern preoccupation right now with money is hopefully changing. I think, I think younger people are becoming more aware. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I never knew anything about a credit score. Lots and lots of people in their 20s understand their, their credit score, you know. They're concerned about their credit. They understand the financial impact. You're forced to have credit cards now because you can't cross the street without a credit card. Um, as, they, as they're closing in on us, it's also making people much more aware. Look at cars. Car insurance. Um, you know, if you just... Thinking about it, being aware of it, is, is basically half the problem. Um, 
maybe young people's families. I forgot to say something else in terms of inheritance and succession. If you have money to leave to your children, and you know, like in a bit, you know, if it's a second marriage and you do have some money, you do have some assets, you want them to go to your children, if you put them in a trust for your children, it will A, ensure that it gets to your children and not your new spouse, say you're getting married in your 40s, and B, it will then protect that money when your child gets it because it will come as an inheritance and, and protect them from any dissolution proceedings they go through. So I can't think of any other overriding things. The stress at your body is physical reaction to change. More of your stress level can help you in all walks of your life. And you only have one life. So take care of it. I take my business and my exercise extremely serious. And I do the best I can so I can enjoy the fruits of my labor. And as we're all getting older, we have to think more of our health because no one else cares. And it's important that we all take a moment to do one or two things extra per day. If it's just doing one push-up in the morning or a jumping jack or something, it's better than not doing anything at all. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause for our